Hello, I'm Linda Darling Hammond, president of the Learning Policy Institute, and want to welcome you to this um, webinar on safe and supportive school environments. Uh, this has been a critical time in our country uh, around uh, developing safer school environments that are also welcoming and supportive to students uh, in this post-pandemic era and also in an era where gun violence, uh, where school shootings have become so commonplace that almost every state has shooting drills uh, during school each day. It's been a very um, difficult uh, political moment as well as an educational moment. Uh, but uh, recently, a year ago, the Congress managed to pass the Bipartisan um, Safer Communities Act. Uh, and we will soon hear from one of the leaders in the Congress who was involved in that. Uh, and uh, we're going to take up the question today in this webinar of what can and should schools do to create safe and, and welcoming environments? What does the evidence say about what works and what matters in this regard? And I'm delighted that we are going to start off with Congressman Bobby Scott, uh, who is the ranking member of the House Education and Workforce Committee, of which he's been a member for 30 years, and he led the uh, committee from 2019 through 2023. Congressman Scott, it is wonderful to see you. Under his leadership, uh, the committee passed the Every Student Succeeds Act in 2015 that really leaned in on how to provide equitable opportunities for support, uh, both in terms of academic and a well-rounded education with the services that students need to succeed. He spearheaded critical parts of the congressional response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and he worked with others to pass the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Uh, the intersection of education, civil rights, and equity has been a cornerstone of Congressman Scott's career, uh, making sure our education system is fair and equitable, as well as adequately resourced and accessible has been at the heart of his work for over five decades in public service. He's also been the godfather of the National Conference on Educating Black Children and the National Equity Coalition, uh, working tirelessly with educators to open up those opportunities. We thank you, Congressman Scott, for joining us this morning. Uh, we know it's a busy time on Capitol Hill. Well, unfortunately, it's not. It's, thank you, Linda, and thank you for, all for, for your hard work over the years, uh, promoting equity and telling us what we need to do based on evidence and research. Uh, regrettably, we're not as busy as we should be. Um, we're not getting done nearly as much as uh, we should, uh, but um, we'll just have to see in the next couple of days what we can get done. But I wanna thank you for what, what you've been doing. Um, I, on, on, on the school safety issue, I've said on crime policy generally, there is a threshold question you have to ask, you have to answer, and that is whether you are following the evidence and research or whether you're just promoting slogans and sound bites. And uh, once you have answered that question, the rest is easy. Uh, but regrettably, the slogans and sound bites have been ruling the day in crime policy and a lot of education policy. And uh, your evidence uh, coming forward with evidence has been extremely uh, helpful. Uh, I want to thank you and, um, and and everyone on the call for your focus on evidence and research um, and uh, make sure that we uh, do the best we can for our, our children. We know that schools should be safe and welcoming environments for all students, but for many students, it's we know it's just not the case. Abusive disciplinary uh, methods where students are subject to harsh and dangerous practices, such as being locked in rooms, forcibly uh, restrained, or even uh, face down with restricted breathing, can create dangerous learning environments for students and pose challenges for their health, safety, academic recess, and social development, and actually make things worse over time, because after they've been through that um, uh, experience, they're ready to really get into fights. Um, and so uh, those, um, uh, regrettably, the restraints and things like that, uh, we know don't work, are not good uh, modifiers of behavior, and, um, and, and we can do better, and that's why your research is so valuable. Uh, these abusive disciplinary practices 
are obviously disproportionately found in schools uh, uh, attended by minorities. Um, those with um, inflicted on those with disabilities, black students, male students in this Congress, I remain committed to advancing the Keeping All Students Safe Act, which prohibit any school receiving federal funds from, from secluding a child or using uh, or, uh, dangerous restraint practices. As policymakers, researchers, and, and educators on this call, we must be mindful also to those who care for our children. Uh, they need to be supported, and parents need to be in the loop. That's why Keeping All Students Safe Act would be uh, also provide school staff with the evidence-based training they need. If they can't do uh, restraints and uh, seclusion, then they got to know what what can they use. And uh, if they don't know what else to use, then you're back to um, uh, to the uh, policies that don't work. Uh, this will allow parents to work with the school and the students to prevent problems from happening in the um, in the future. They're making matters worse. Gun-related violence coupled, coupled with uh, the alarming rise of school shootings has left students even afraid to attend class. This often results in knee-jerk reactions back to the slogans and sound bites, put more police in school, invest in metal detectors, turn schools into fortresses. The research is clear that more guns in schools, even if you, you can build them like Fort Knox, do not make students or teachers safer. Moreover, it's likely to negatively impact the most, most vulnerable students. If you treat them like criminals, lo and behold, they'll probably become criminals and start acting like criminals. Now, these measures create a culture of fear and anxiety uh, that exacerbate the school to prison pipeline and can impose barriers that make schools less accessible to students with physical disabilities and do nothing to reduce violence. And as again, we can choose slogans and sound bites or evidence. We know from the evidence that these metal detectors do not reduce uh, school shootings, uh, but they do a survey purpose. If the people are yelling at you at a school board meeting, you say, oh, we're gonna do metal detectors, they tend to shut up. So you get metal detectors. Uh, that's the last Congress. We uh, did pass a Bipartisan Safer Community Act, which enhances certain restrictions and penalties on firearm purchases, promotes evidence-based practices uh, it's for school safety, authorizes grants to expand access to mental health services, and appropriates emergency funding for mental health resources and school safety measures. Although this was the first significant legislative effort in 30 years that addresses anything involving firearms, we know that no one policy will prevent every school shooting and there's still a lot more work to be done. Uh, so I wanna thank you again, uh, Linda, and all, everyone on the call for all that you do, particularly pre uh, pre uh, pre presenting evidence so that we have something instructive to work with other than the poll tested slogans and sound bites. And I look forward to a productive discussion on behalf of, um, uh, of your panelists and look forward to their recommendations. And with that, I'll pass the uh, mic back over to Linda. Thank you so much. Uh, we thank you, Congressman Scott, both for following the evidence uh, in so many uh, parts of the congressional work that you do and in the leadership that you've shown on so many of these issues. And as you said, ironically, you know, quite often the measures that people want to take to create safety uh, actually create more uh, anxiety, uh, less of a feeling of safety for many of the students uh, who are experiencing those. And so now we're going to go to the evidence, and I'm going to introduce uh, Jennifer um, DePauli, who is one of the authors of our report on uh, Safe Schools, Thriving Students, What Do We Know About Creating Safe and Supportive Schools?, uh, and Jen is a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute and director of our Whole Child Policy Table. And with that, uh, Jen, please uh, take it away and inform us about what the research shows. Thank you, Linda. And thank you also to Congressman Scott. That was that was great and perfect uh, for this report. So as uh, both Linda and Congressman Scott were saying, um, we took an interest in in learning about the evidence because we wanted to know 
what actually works when it comes to keeping kids both physically and psychologically safe. Um, we know that there's always an increased interest in school safety after there are mass school shootings. And we also know that students face other violence at schools as well. Um, and those episodes of violence at schools hold negative consequences for both students and educators. Um, so we undertook this, this report because we know that there is widespread agreement that all children deserve a safe and healthy school environment, but there's significant debate about how best to promote student safety. Proposed strategies generally fall into two broad categories, strategies that increase physical security and those that build a supportive school community in order to protect against violence. This study that Linda named, Safe Schools Thriving Students, examined the research evidence behind several strategies schools can adopt to improve school safety to help policymakers make evidence-based decisions. And I'll hold one second while we catch up on the slides. Thank you. Um, so moving into the first branch, we'll first discuss the evidence regarding strategies focused on increasing physical security often known as school hardening measures. And we can skip ahead two slides. Perfect. Um, so use of strategies to improve the physical security of schools has increased substantially over the past two decades. And as of the 2019-20 school year, almost all schools had security cameras, required visitors to sign in and wear badges, and controlled access to the building during school hours. Um, so when we look at those top, uh, some of those top uh, physical security measures, we see that when uh, schools control access to the building and badge staff and visitors, um, there are no studies out there of the impact of these measures on school safety. And this could be perhaps be due to the prevalence of these activities and the relatively low cost of enacting these policies. Um, security cameras have increased in, in use substantially over time. There's no evidence that they improve student safety or reduce school violence. And then metal detectors, which aren't actually that much in use across schools, um, but are often proposed as a school safety measure, as Congressman Scott said, um, because of their perceived ability to prevent weapons from being brought into the school building. Um, but the evidence behind them does not support expanding their use. Of the two studies examining the relationship between metal detectors and school safety, one found reports of fewer weapons being carried to school. However, neither found that the presence of metal detectors reduced the number of reported threats, physical fights, or student victimization in school. And some studies have found that metal detectors are associated with decreased feelings of safety among students. Next, we looked at the presence of school resource officers. School resource officers are sworn law enforcement officers with arrest powers who work either full or part-time in a school setting. In the 2019-20 school year, approximately four out of 10 and about seven out of 10 secondary schools excuse me, four out of 10 elementary and seven out of 10 secondary schools had a school resource officer who routinely carried a weapon in school. Research shows their presence has limited effects on school safety. Uh, they increase the number of weapons detected and decrease the number of fights within schools, but have no effects on the rates of school shootings or gun-related incidents. And the presence, uh, the presence of school resource officers often have substantive negative imp impacts on students, particularly students of color and students with disabilities. On average, the presence of school resource officers increases suspensions, expulsions, police referrals, and student arrests, all of which can have long-term negative impacts on students. Um, studies of school resource officers, uh, the implementation of their use suggests factors that may partially explain these negative effects on students. First, there is high variability in how school resource officers are utilized across schools, with some officers spending the majority of their time teaching classes related to public safety and violence prevention, while others spend the majority of their time on law enforcement activities. In some schools, school resource officers have no role in school discipline, while in other schools, they have a major role in discipline. 
And involvement of school resource officers in everyday school discipline has been found to lead to weaker relationships between students and teachers and increase the severity of punishment against students. SROs often also lack clearly specified roles and responsibilities. In the 2017-18 school year, only two-thirds of schools with a school resource officer reported having a policy outlining the officer's roles and responsibilities. And even in schools that reported having a policy, about a third of those principals were unaware whether the policy covered important topics, such as engagement in student discipline and use of firearms. Studies have also lacked, uh, except, excuse me, identified a lack of training as an issue, with one study finding that many SROs had not received specialized training prior to entering their school position. And the training that school resource, resource officers do receive is highly variable. Uh, a 2018 survey of school resource officers conducted by EdWeek found that school resource officers were more likely to have received training on law enforcement techniques, such as responding to active shooters, than in areas focused on the specialized needs of youth, such as child trauma and working with special, special education students. Um, and the last one we looked at in physical security was arming school staff. In the wake of school shootings over the past decade, some politicians have proposed arming school staff. And as of 2020, 28 states allow schools to arm teachers or staff in at least some circumstances. However, this policy lacks broad public support. And there is no evidence that arming staff in K-12 schools would improve school safety. And evidence on firearm deaths outside of schools suggests that having more guns in schools could be detrimental to school or to student safety. Um, and so next we turn to strategies to build supportive school communities, given the growing, in growing interest in improving school safety by addressing the underlying causes of school violence and strengthening the factors that protect against the perpetration of school violence. Um, multiple studies have examined what places students at risk of perpetrating violence and the factors that protect against school violence. Studies examining mass shootings, school shootings, and school violence align in finding a common set of risk factors among perpetrators in addition to ready access to guns. These include childhood trauma, mental health concerns, and prior perpetration of violence. In contrast, research identifies empathy, school attachment and belonging, social support, and supportive student-teacher relationships as factors that protect against school violence. When students feel welcome and connected to their school community, they have improved mental health, academic, and behavioral outcomes and are less likely to engage in high-risk behaviors. As a result, strategies such as mental health supports, social-emotional learning, restorative practices, and building positive relationships in school climates should be considered as part of school safety strategies. Uh, the first one we looked at is uh, increasing access to mental health supports, which have been shown to benefit students and schools. Studies have found that counselors reduce disciplinary incidents, disciplinary recidivism, and they improve teachers' perceptions of school climate and student behavior, as well as increasing academic achievement. A meta-analysis of school-based mental health uh, services in elementary schools found overall positive effects on students' mental health when there was access to it. But schools' ability to provide needed supports is strained. Many students do not have adequate access to school counselors or psychologists. Uh, as you can see on the screen, the American School Counselor Association recommends a student to school counselor ratio of 250 to one, but nationally schools average a ratio of 408 students to one counselor. Similarly, access to mental health services is limited. The National Association of School Psychologists recommends a ratio of 500 students to one school psychologist, yet in 2020-21 school year, the national average of students to psychologists was 1,127 uh, school psychologists to, to a student. Um, and many schools also lack the ability to provide diagnostic mental health assessments to evaluate students for mental health disorders. During the 2019-20 school year, only 55% of public schools reported providing diagnostic mental health assessment services, and 42% offered mental health treatment services to students. More than half of schools reported that their ability to provide mental health services to students was limited in a significant way by inadequate funding, 
while another 40% described insufficient access to mental health professionals as a barrier. Um, next, we looked at social emotional learning. Uh, part of the reason we looked at this is because there is such a strong evidence base, but it also in the 2021-22 school year, approximately three quarters of schools used a social and emotional learning program or curriculum. And there is a large body of research on social emotional learning programs that find that they help promote and uh, the development of social emotional competencies. They reduce the rates of behavior problems and emotional distress. They increase rates of pro-social behavior. They improve relationships with others and they increase students' engagement and learning and academic achievement. Uh, next, we looked at restorative practices. Restorative practices build community and resolve conflict with opportunities to make amends and are, all, are an alternative to exclusionary discipline practices, which you heard Congressman Scott talk about, which are not only ineffective in improving school safety, they are harmful to students' academic achievement and attainment, and they're inequitably applied to Black students and students with disabilities. Um, stu uh, studies of restorative practices consistently find that they improve school safety, reduce the use of exclusionary discipline, decrease rates of student misbehavior, and improve school climate, and they also uh, have recently been found to improve academic achievement. And last, we looked at uh, building positive relationships. So structures that support positive relationships within schools include small learning communities, advisory systems, block scheduling, looping, um, smaller class size, and really emphasizing strong school family connections. This is especially important when it comes to school safety. Um, so that they can avoid the cracks that certain students might fall into um, and not have anybody uh, to talk to about any of the issues they may be facing uh, at school or, or at home. Multiple studies have found that positive relationships between students and staff throughout the school can help prevent physical violence and bullying. And one study found that they can improve communication between students and teachers about potential threats which can play a significant role in disrupting violent incidences. So the policy recommendations we feature in our report um, uh, are, are listed on your screen. The research evidence suggests that investments in increasing students' access to school-based mental health services, adopting restorative practices, supporting social-emotional learning, and developing structures and practices that support the development of positive relationships between educators, students, and families will help promote school safety and student well being goals. Um, and to better understand the, the state of school safety measures across the country, we also recommend that policymakers incorporate measures of school safety and student well being in state and federal data collection uh, and better support states and districts in conducting equity reviews of school safety measures uh, and their impact on discipline outcomes. And last, I will just say, as Linda mentioned, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, and obviously Congressman Scott played a big part in that. Um, we wanted to look at how uh, states are distributing those Bipartisan Safer Community Act funds. Um, the Bipartisan Safer Community Act funds that went through the Department of Ed through Title IV Part A um, were designated as stronger as the Stronger Connections Grant Programs by the Department of Ed. We did a quick scan across all of the states to see what they were doing um, with those states. And the good news is the majority of states have prioritized student well-being and mental health. You can see Washington and Ohio, two of those states that uh, in their grant program uh, were focusing on student wellness, creating positive and inclusive and supportive school environments, and helping kids really engage in learning so that uh, in a way that they feel both, uh, excuse me, so supporting schools to feel both uh, supporting schools to help students feel both physically and psychologically safe in schools. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Linda uh, for our great panel discussion. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, and we have a wonderful panel uh, and I think we'll wanna see who they are. Uh, we have with us this afternoon, uh, Dr. Um, Jennifer McCombs, who's the Chief of Research at the Learning Policy Institute and co-author of the report that we're discussing today. She does a spectacular job of uh, overseeing our research teams and mentoring and um, managing our research and project staff. And we're 
fortunate to have recruited her from the Rand Corporation, where she was uh, a leading researcher for uh, more than two decades. We have Dr. Um, Jacqueline Rodriguez, who's the Chief Executive Officer at the National Center for Learning Disabilities. As CEO, Jackie leads a team in the forefront of the learning disabilities rights movement. And she works on issues uh, ranging from uh, equity and high quality education uh, through uh, high leverage culturally responsive practices and inclusive education. Uh, we have Tony Thurman, who is the State Superintendent of Public Instruction in California and a dear friend and colleague. Uh, who is an educator, a social worker, a public school parent. He came to this role from the California legislature. He's also been a local school board member and lived to tell about it. And over the course of his tenure, he has championed many historic initiatives on behalf of California students, including leading our schools through the pandemic, helping to safely reopen California schools, uh, expanding mental health resources and community schools, after school and summer school programs, and supporting restorative practices to build strong relationships in schools. And Dr. Ivory Tolson, who is the Director of Education Innovation and Research at the NAACP and Professor of Counseling Psychology at Howard University. And uh, Ivory has served as the President and CEO of the Quality Education for Minorities Network, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Negro Education. He was appointed by President Obama to devise national strategies to sustain and expand federal support to historically black colleges and universities uh, when he was uh, executive director of that White House initiative. Uh, he's also served as a research analyst for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And we welcome uh, all of these amazing panelists with us today. And I'd like to start off with one sort of one sentence question for each of you, and then I'm going to come back to Superintendent Thurman for uh, a framework about how to pursue uh, safe schools, as has been done in California. But when you think of a safe school, what are the things that come to mind uh, just in a few words about what that looks like and feels like? And can I start with um, Jennifer McCombs? You should probably start with somebody else because <laughs> I would say that sort of like in this, I think about sort of like the students experiencing care and connection from adults. Like I think about that a lot when I think about what safe schools feel like. But in my mind, I also, I go to thinking about the structures and practices that undergird that. Those types of connections don't happen by accident. They take a lot of like resources, time, training, and structures inside the school system to make it all come together. Terrific. Jacqueline, I'm going based on who's on my, um, my Zoom screen. <laughs> uh, so I'll pick up where Jennifer um, caught us up. I agree wholeheartedly, a lot of systems in place. I always think about what do I see? What do I hear? What am I smelling? And I, in my mind, I'm seeing kids smiling, kids engaging, kids talking. I'm hearing a lot of conversation between teachers and faculty and wraparound service providers in classrooms. And they're talking to students and students are actually responding and they have agency in that conversation. Um, and I'm seeing classrooms where there is capacity for movement and the ability for students to go into um, particular areas of their choice when they need to learn more about something or investigating something. And they're not refrained to specific seats or chairs, and they're not situated in a classroom where it's around um, an exit in particular. Terrific. Superintendent Thurman. Yeah, and Dr. Darling Hammond and panelists and Congressman Scott. You know, I was thinking about the schools that I visit, and um, so I want to just give a shout out um, to so many of the schools where when you go, you feel welcome. Someone welcomes you when you enter. You enter into a place where you see structure, you see community, you see people who are connected. And, and, and this is what's happening in most of our schools. And unfortunately, sometimes something happens that might um, um, disrupt that whether it's an outside person or even sometimes an inside person who for whatever reason is experiencing some kind of stress that enters into the school. But um, I love going to schools and being welcomed and feeling like I'm in a community. People know each other. There is, uh, uh, as you all talked about, people are smiling, people are excited to learn. Their curiosity is just moving. And, 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 uh, and sadly, uh, we deal with things that sometimes disrupt that, but this panel is gonna help us get through that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ivory. 
Yeah, it's almost for everyone else. It's less about what you see and more about what you feel. Uh, but there are certain things that you, you can identify that make you feel a certain way. Uh, so when I see you know students playing instruments as you walk in the door, uh, when I see artwork on the wall, uh, uplifting messages, um, the interactions between uh, uh, students and their peers and students and their teachers, uh, smiles on the faces, uh, all of that are indications to me that it's a, a safe and affirming learning environment. That's great. I love I love these images. Makes me want to be in all of those places. So uh, Superintendent Thurman, I want to start with you. Uh, you've worked hard uh, and it's been a huge priority for you and for Governor Newsom to ensure that students feel safe uh, and are safe in schools. Um, and as you know, California's uh, undertaken a proactive agenda over the last decade with legislation to reduce access to weapons on the one hand and legislation to replace school exclusions with positive supports for student behavior on the other. And that's you know, dramatically reduced suspensions and violence in schools. Can you talk to us about what California has done and is doing to create safe, inclusive, thriving environments? Thank you, Dr. Darling Hammond, uh, for the research from the Learning Policy Institute. All of the studies, um, I would I, we would plus one what we heard, and the experience of those in our schools uh, mirrors very nicely uh, with what was stated about the research. We don't want to create these hardened environments um, that make our students feel uncomfortable. We want to create environments where they feel supported. And if there's any level of stress, we want to get support for students and educators to be able to address that stress. Our classroom teachers and staff, they become the first line of support for recognizing when someone is experiencing stress. And we have a great training called Mental Health First Aid. Um, that educators get trained in. And it's not asking them to become a therapist. It's simply helping them to recognize when someone is experiencing stress or trauma and so that we get them to the right person. And this is one of the trainings that is being offered at schools throughout the state and certainly um, in other parts of the country. Uh, but we've made significant investments in programs that are proven to work. Restorative justice, um, you know, our state has administered over $150 million dollars um, in restorative justice dollars, um, because we know that the punishment approach, it, it has not delivered the results that have been intended. But when we approach things in a restorative way, um, we are able to work through challenges, rebuild relationships, uh, keep students safe. Um, you know, many of you have touched on the need to address the mental health needs of our students, and our state has invested significantly in many different ways. You know, community schools, we're investing now $5 billion in community schools. Those are the wraparound supports that can uh, connect a student to a counselor or a health program or social services, but also to really have conversations about how we end the school to prison pipeline, um, how we engage the community in the school. Um, our state is focused deeply on mental health programs. Our governor has launched a $5 billion uh, mental health program that I call the No Wrong Door program, where you can get supports at school or through community behavioral health. And those programs start to work together and speak together, regardless of what kind of insurance you have. You have private insurance or Medicaid. We have to make sure that we give supports. And, you know, Dr. Darling Hammond and I have worked together to secure the funds that will allow us to recruit 10,000 additional mental health clinicians in our schools. And so we know that school is the center for so many things. And, and we find ways to address many of our students. Um, you know, I was very moved by the conversation and the research about school resource officers. You know, as a former school board member, as Dr. Darling Hammond said, what I notice is that sometimes um, uh, schools misuse school resource officers. They use them as the dean of students. They use them to address student behavior. And, and that's where it begins as a breakdown as the research shows that contact with students uh, invariably, sadly, um, creates a criminalizing experience for students who are maybe just doing things that students do. Um, I have to say, 
that well-trained school resource officers actually do develop relationships with students. They know how to intervene in ways that are more about preventing um, and de-escalating. They have great training in de-escalation and they have relationships with students that can prevent things from rising to the highest level of threat at which point we do need someone with a law enforcement background to engage. And so um, our school districts need training, not just for school resource officers, but also for security who are in how to de-escalate activities uh, with our students. A lot of times school security don't get much training, um, but they're put into situations where they have to engage with uh, all kinds of behavior work. One of the pieces of legislation that we've introduced and we're working on still is a new model for working with students that we call um, um, behavioral intervention. Um, really, it's, it's a fancy way of saying folks who can do de-escalation, those who build relationships with students, those who know that sometimes conflicts at school start outside of the school and they find themselves back in the school. They start on social media sometimes. Someone has had mm -hmm. hard words for someone else. And so we're trying to really build out this new model where staff who work in the hallways, who work in the schools, get training in de-escalation and restorative practice and conflict mediation. We put out a message to our schools that we want them to limit the number of suspensions and expulsions. There are a I'm I'm seeing uh, things freeze on my screen, and I think it might be my internet. I don't so, think it's you, Linda. I think no, I think it's only Tony. Superintendent Thurman. So we will come back around to um, his. I want to hear the rest of that um, story, but we'll come back around when uh, the internet improves on his end, <laughs> and. Um, We'll move now, I, I think, to um, another question that's related to the point he was making, which is one of the statistics that has really stood out to me is that among school shootings, more than 95% are from students who used to be in that school, and more than 85% of those students express uh, their belief that they've been bullied during the time that they were in school. So reducing things like, um, you know, providing mental health services on the one hand and reducing things like bullying on the other is part of the solution to the school shootings issues as well. Oh, Tony, you're back. That's great. <laughs> I'm going to let you finish your thought because we I figured that meant I went too far. I won't go any further other than to say <laughs> that we are really pleased to work with folks uh, from Congressman Scott's district. Next month, we are having a training on uh, school safety. Um, we've invited um, the folks from the Sandy Hook Promise Foundation to be with us. Um, to share what they've learned uh, from tragedy to how we can help. We've also invited some new partners into the conversation who have technology that can actually detect a gun, um, even if it's been, um, even if it's disguised. And, um, you know, we're really doing everything that we can to help our schools, but they have the resources to bring on training, um, to do more mental health. And uh, we echo all the things that the research has shown um, rather than hardening, providing more supports for students and their families and in the community and building partnership will result in safer schools. So thank you for having me on. And I look forward to hearing uh, from our other panelists. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we got you back. Um, I want to um, build on that and go to um, Dr. McCombs and ask about um, the evidence base for school safety strategies uh, in terms of what works, what recommendations do you have around practice? Why should we, what kinds of practices should we be paying attention to in schools? Yeah, so I, I wanna build on sort of like this question and a little bit of what Superintendent Thurman said. And I think that there are two things that really come out of the research very clearly. And the first is that investment in counselors, mental health services, restorative practices, social emotional learning, structures to support positive relationships pay off in terms of improvements to school safety, improved student well-being, and also achievement. And the second is investment in supports for students is desperately needed. So it's really heartening to hear about California's investments. So 
one of the things that's striking is like when we look at the data and Jen presented this, um, you know, most schools have a lot of physical security in place already. 91% of schools have security cameras already. Um, however, the vast majority of schools lack sufficient staff to adequately support students. So the average counselor and psychologist have caseloads like two times what is recommended. 42% um, of schools report being able to, to provide mental health services. That's like almost two thirds of schools that aren't doing that. Um, and investments in supportive services aren't simply what's recommended based on the research, you know, sort of like they're what schools currently lack sufficient access to, which means sort of like, it's like just an extra propelling of sort of like why we need investments in this. It's like what schools actually need, they don't have enough of, and what is going to be effective in helping to support, um, you know, positive environments, um, protective environments that, you know, for now, and then also, Linda, as you talked about, sort of like this idea about how it pays forward. The more that people feel connected, the more that we are establishing those protective connections, sort of like early in life, that has spillover effects later in life as well. Yeah. Now, we know the research on, um, for example, social emotional learning supports, when, when we take the time to help students learn how to be together in community, how to interact with each other, how to resolve conflicts, uh, academic achievement also increases. So it's the pathway uh, to that achievement rather than a distraction from the purposes of schools. Um, doc, I'm going to uh, ask Dr. Rodriguez, um, you know, the, the data consistently show, as you know, that students with disabilities and students of color are more likely to be negatively impacted by exclusionary discipline policies and school hardening. Um, can you talk about the impact of these measures on students and why it's important to address the issue of disparities in uh, the context of school safety? Absolutely. So I think what would be helpful for those in the audience that are thinking about disability as a part of the intersectional identities that students bring to and with them to school, some data might help. So we'll start simply by stating the facts, right? Students with disabilities are absolutely disproportionately impacted by the presence of law enforcement in schools. We can just essentially agree on that. That's what the literature says. That's what the evidence has demonstrated. Of course, we're deeply concerned about this. Um, NCLD actually has a report called Unlocking Futures, Youth with Learning Disabilities and the Juvenile Justice System. Um, we provide recommendations throughout the report to address the issue. But I also want to bring to attention that according to the civil rights data collection, not just students with learning disabilities, but all disabilities served under IDEA represent only 13% of the total student population, while they represent 27, double and more of the percent of students referred to law enforcement. Huge disparities exist, and in particular, even greater disparities exist for Black and Latino um, men and with disabilities, which make up 3% of enrollment, but quadruple the amount of student arrests. If we just stop there, I think we would recognize why this topic is so incredibly important. But we, we even think further, students with disabilities are almost three times more likely to be arrested than their non-disabled peers, and they're estimated at this point to make up 30 to 60% of the incarcerated youth. And that statistic is incredibly hard to even pin down given the, the variance of 30 to 60, simply because we don't even have accurate data. So as I mentioned, 13% of kids have a disability, but they account for 20% of in-school suspensions and 25% of out-of-school suspensions. And let's just finalize that with corporal punishment which I think we could all agree needs to be outside of schools, but is still allowed in almost half of American states across the country. So um, knowing that, right, we can also, I think, agree on a couple of premises. We are um, incredibly supportive of the congressman's initiatives and those of the superintendent. Um, I think we all agree that SROs have a place in schools, but that place needs to be clearly defined and there needs to be adequate training and support to create those valid um, and supportive relationships with schools. Um, but ultimately, schools need to be welcoming. They must be inclusive and they have to be positive for all the students that come through their door. And I just want to call out the fact that that includes students of all identities. 
and they need to have those identities affirmed. They need to walk into schools knowing that they can be them, their authentic selves. Um, we don't agree that it should be appropriate to suspend or expel or refer a student to juvenile justice for a minor offense, but yet it's happening day after day, week after week. Um, and thankfully, the Office of Civil Rights is really engaged in this work. So let me wrap this up by giving um, the folks listening some opportunities to consider what to do next, the so what factors, I like to say. Um, we are fully supportive of the Counseling Not Criminalization in Schools Act. This ends federal funding for school-based law enforcement, but yet redirects the funds to counselors, to teachers, and to positive supports for children in school with which we have all said on this call so far, are really the bread and butter of how schools become affirming places. Um, we really wanna see grants provided to states and districts to invest in positive approaches to addressing school climate um, and prioritizing and awarding these grants to conduct research on the connection between learning and attention disorders and disabilities and the potential risk for involvement in the juvenile justice system. As you can imagine, doubling those in, in the school systems with an LD, for example, in the incarceration um, system is just not okay, and it has to stop. So if we yeah. can increase capacity for school counseling, for mental health programs, um, and for teachers to learn how to create safe learning environments in their own classrooms, and do that with the support of a superintendent like Dr. Thurman, and knowing that they that superintendent has their back when they're in the classroom working with all students, that's gonna be a part of the strategy to solve the issue. Yeah. One of our um, uh, participants uh, notes in the chat that some students develop disabling reactions and anxiety in response to school practices. And then as we know, that traumatized reaction then triggers hypervigilance and you know, behaviors that would not be occurring in a calm and you know, productive space. So Dr. Tolson, I want to kind of come to you and, and ask, um, given, you know, both the um, dis disproportionate impact of exclusionary discipline and some of these other traumatizing experiences, uh, what are the proactive measures that a school can take um, to both create a culture of belonging and to bring families into the school community to help bridge the gap? Uh, what kinds of things can schools proactively do? Yeah, so I can think of a few. Um, so the first thing that schools have to do is a self-assessment, uh, and these are four questions I think every school should ask themselves, uh, and I'll touch on some of the things that schools can do. But the first question to ask yourself is, are your students happy? Generally, are they happy? Um, when you asked us to describe a safe learning environment, I think all of us had happiness somewhere in there. Uh, and if they're not happy, find out why. Students who are hot will tend to act out more. People, students who don't have good food to eat, if, they're, if, they're, if their food in the cafeteria is just really nasty to them, then you may not have good experiences with them. If they don't have enough outdoor time, if they don't have enough green in their environment, uh, if they don't have any opportunities to express themselves freely. So all of these are, are connected to safety. So just a simple question, how happy are your students? Uh, and if your students are very, very happy, you probably have less problems. If your students are miserable, then you probably have a lot of problems. Uh, and the good news is it doesn't take much to make them happy. Um, some of the, all those things that I just said. Um, yeah. The second thing is, are your students culturally affirmed and do they feel like they belong in that environment? Can they see themselves reflected in what they're learning? And can they see themselves reflected in the people who are teaching them? Do they see themselves on the walls? Do they feel included? Do they feel like they belong? Uh, and, you know, all of these things, having uh, a, a culturally responsive uh, pedagogy, uh, having activities, having uh, art, uh, all of these things help students feel like they, they belong. Uh, the third question is, do your students have a safe way to communicate with adults about problems that they might have or things that they observe? There is a study that says that 
more weapons are taken away from schools from students talking to an adult than metal detectors. Students don't want those weapons in the school because it's gonna hurt them before it hurts anybody else. What they need is a safe and confidential way to talk about it. Um, now, we have created education systems where students see as a means of survival talking less. They learn very early that keeping quiet is a way to do better in school. We need to reverse that. We need to make sure that they understand uh, uh, their voice is important. And the, the, the fourth one is, do your teachers and staff have ongoing trainings on this topic? And are they given the right amount of data in order to understand the problems that are happening? There are a lot of conversations I have with, with, with professionals at the school, and I might ask, why do you suspend students? And they'll say, because students are being violent towards teachers or their peers. But then when you look at their books, it's really because students are chewing gum. Our students aren't wearing the right clothes. Our students have come to school late. So instead of them, you know, that better late than never doesn't even apply to them. So look at the books, talk about the data that we have and have ongoing training because we can have, we can implement uh, different uh, processes uh, like uh, a restorative justice. Uh, but there's been a lot of times we've implemented restorative justice, but teachers don't really embrace it because they haven't been bought in. They haven't gotten the, the basic training on how to check their own biases uh, and the, the importance of that um, uh, safe learning environment. Good, good suggestions. Uh, and um, there's so many sources of data that teachers and other school staff can use to figure out how students are feeling. You know, the school climate surveys, uh, taking those seriously, on pursuing those, following up. Uh, in one of our uh, reports that's coming out soon, we, there's a set of examples about how students are actually conducting professional development for teachers about what they feel they need. And, you know, there are lots of ways then to begin to reset the, the culture there. Um, I want to pursue this question about um, the ways in which we can uh, examine the sort of next steps for creating school safety. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, you know, the, the disability community has been advocating for changes to school environments uh, for decades at this point, um, from accessibility of resources to accommodations to positive behavioral interventions to um, eliminating seclusion and restraint, which Congressman Scott spoke to in his remarks earlier. What lessons have you learned about what's most effective at creating um, the kinds of school settings that are supportive for all students, including um, students with disabilities. So Linda, perhaps I can touch a bit on the seclusion and restraint piece because you're absolutely right. The disability community, including NCLD, has been advocating now for decades to update and make significant changes to policies around seclusion and restraint. Um, it's our premise, and I think that of the disability community, that seclusion does not belong in schools, should not be used in schools. And I think if anybody's using seclusion as a behavior management technique, that is one of those non-examples that we should be, you know, heralding from the mountaintops. Um, restraining students in particular also should be used in such rare instances that it has to do with the student is a threat to themselves or to another person. And yet we know that 80% of students subjected to physical restraint are kids with disabilities. And 77% of those same students that are subjected to seclusion are kids with disabilities. So they're disproportionately impacted in this space. And oftentimes I think because they're not necessarily getting those questions that Dr. Tolson just mentioned answered by their faculty, by their staff, by their families. And they're not able to communicate either what is going well or what is not going well in their schools, in their classrooms, in their after school activities in such a way that an adult with some sort of agency or authority is listening and then taking action. Um, I think one thing I would do want to mention to those listening is 
we're really, really excited and very thankful that the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Civil Rights has made this a part of the agenda under this administration and has taken active steps to investigate states where seclusion and restraint has become not just disproportionate, but egregious and is issuing guidance as well as dear colleagues letters. So um, that has been fruitful. But the bottom line is that I think we can all agree <laughs> zero tolerance policies do not belong in schools. They don't have any evidence to suggest that they actually support student well-being, academic outcomes, or any lifelong uh, supports. And they were grounded in the incarceration and system from the beginning. So to me, it makes perfect sense that those policies only lead to further juvenile issues and um, into a system that where students don't belong. Um, Congressman Scott said it really perfectly earlier. They perpetuate systemic racism. And that's not something we're saying as a soundbite. There is ample research and evidence that demonstrates that zero tolerance policies are bottom line harmful to students of color in particular, right? We talked about positive behavioral interventions. I wanna highlight that as not only um, a strategy, but one that has a basic literature, you know, that has um, demonstrated outcomes. And we know that PBIS and systems, even when implemented with fidelity, still has incredible outcomes for all students. And they don't just support these systems students of kids and kids with disabilities. They support all kids and they encourage kids to talk to one another so that the bullying decreases and the sense of compassion, that sense of integrity and the sense of empathy actually increases. So we want to see not only more research in this area, but more fidelity and implementation when it comes to um, school systems. And finally, if you're out there advocating and you're thinking about what's happening um, in Congress that you can support, you know, we'll draw your attention to the school climate bills. Totally supportive, as the Congressman noted earlier, the Keeping All Students Safe Act, an incredible piece of legislation that ends seclusion and really puts guardrails around the use of restraint in schools. Uh, we are also supporting the Protecting Our Students in Schools Act, which effectively ends corporal punishment in schools. And finally, the Safe Schools Improvement Act, which establishes federal standards to protect every student, not just students with disabilities, but I'll argue we should keep students with disabilities at the center of our decision making from bullying and harassment in public school systems. Um, I'm going to, um, in a moment, uh, start to address some of the questions that have come from our listeners. Uh, and I want to encourage everyone to chime in. I do want to note that if people want to see some great examples of school environments like those that you and Dr. Tolson just described, uh, there are two um, case studies of inclusion uh, schools, middle and high schools, that have uh, developed this very strong, positive environment. Bronxdale High School in New York City uh, and Gateway High School, Middle and High School in California. Maybe somebody can put those in the chat if you want to see them. And these are places where students are involved as um, both um, peer mediators with, you know, with each other uh, as leads in advisory systems where uh, students are learning social and emotional skills as in a context where there's an explicit um, uh, way of addressing the fact that everyone learns differently and everyone comes with a different set of um, talents, interests, skills, and ways of learning. And we're really um, creating a uh, compassionate environment, as you put it, is part of the explicit curriculum. Uh, so uh, there's there are lots of our colleagues we can learn from on this. Uh, in terms of the... Um, questions coming from the audience. Uh, one of them uh, that was sent in uh, during the uh, registration was, uh, how can we really engage families to reinforce and help create uh, student environments that are uh, supportive? And uh, relatedly, how do we best uh, provide the right kinds of professional development? So I wanna see if anybody would like to address uh, either of those related questions. Jen, you look like you're getting ready to lean in. Well, I'll take on the, the professional development piece 
first, because I think that this is a thread that's come throughout this conversation is sort of the need for support and training for all school, school staff. Um, and so we see this in terms of like thinking about how do we train people if we're, when we're moving towards restorative practices, we're getting rid of exclusionary practice. How is it that we prepare and train all of our school staff to be able to implement that? And I think that there's a special tie-in to, to thinking about school resource officers for schools that have them and the importance of training for those individuals. And one of the things that we see from the implementation research is that a lot of them come in not having sufficient training. Um, you know, and we think about, I think it was 37% received training related to teenage brain. Only 54% of school resource officers report training working with students in special education programs, right? And so these are areas where um, we need to sort of like, if you have school resource officers, be paying attention to these things, sort of like what are the parameters, what are the roles, what are the trainings that's needed, and thinking systemically about all of your school staff and helping to implement the conditions of teaching and learning. Um, from a parental perspective, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about as a parent myself is one thing that we need to do is actually be advocating for the things that matter the most with our school boards um, and to be reinforcing and supporting schools who are trying to do these types of evidence-based practices um, in order to provide them um, political backing um, for implementing them. And what about that? Thank you very much. And what about engaging families? What can we do to, um, you know, bridge the the divide and, and, and ensure that families are able to be, you know, more uh, welcomed and productively engaged? Um, so um, I'll speak maybe from personal experience, like Jen, I'm a, a parent of a school-aged child and um, what I have found is that schools deeply want to engage with families, but are reluctant to or don't necessarily know exactly what and how to implement those types of strategies. Um, and it's interesting because I think there's a, a meeting of the minds where families want to be involved and invested in the school system and administrators and teachers equally agree that they should be in the system, but in what capacity. So I'll highlight one space that I've seen some really, really cool promise. So in the state of Ohio right now, um, a faculty member from Bowling Green State University and another colleague um, from a similar um, institution has been working with the state of Ohio to develop a set of modules for families of students with disabilities in an effort to not only uh, provide knowledge around disability, around awareness, about impact, but also around advocacy. And the advocacy isn't necessarily at the local or state or federal level, but within their own school buildings. And so they're taking these modules, attending these courses, and at the culmination, they're able to better communicate with their school administrators about what supports their own students might need or the special ed program in that school in principle, like in general. And um, principals across um, spaces in which this is being um, uh, disseminated have said that this is really important because it's not just having families come to a PTO or a family school association meeting or a parent teacher conference, but they know their kids just as well as a teacher might. And they also understand that the community partnership is deeply important. And so how can parents actually be a part of the decision-making process in those schools? But let's start also by providing awareness, knowledge, and skills too. So um, that's one way I think if people wanted to replicate that, I'm happy to share the information in here, but a neat option for kids with disabilities and their families to be more invested in schools. Yeah. And, you know, when we think about it, a lot of the schools that are, have been putting in place these kinds of um, supports really rethink the way that the school schedule is designed, you know, instead of, you know, uh, back to school night when you're not supposed to talk about your own child, they've found the time and carved out the opportunities for home visits, for student teacher family conferencing, for uh, a variety of ways that, as you say, parents can learn. Uh, also about how to support um, productive behaviors uh, because everybody comes from different, you know, um, experiences. So um, thinking about what the job of the school is beyond the just 
factory model uh, offering of courses is part of making the room for that kind of uh, engagement. We have a question about the role of diversity uh, and representation in the uh, not only the teaching force, but in the staffing of schools and creating the kind of environment that will be supportive and welcoming. Um, Ivory, I want to ask you to respond to that because you've done so much work on this yeah. question, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so diversity is very important. Um, it's important that students have teachers, educators that look like them. Um, but I also want to caution um, you know, not to be superficial about it. It's not just about uh, how many Black and Latino and, and uh, you know, how many men versus women. It, it's, it's not just about that, uh, because even though we may have racial diversity, it's hard to achieve economic diversity among your teacher force because they all have the same job and the same level of education. And sometimes that difference between how a middle-class person will think or how a college-educated person may think uh, is a lot different than what a lot of than how a lot of the parents think. Um, you know, for instance, a lot of um, a lot of parents they see the school as professionals who know how to do a certain thing, kind of like we see doctors. We're not going to tell doctors how to treat our illness because we don't feel like we have that kind of expertise. Educated parents will tell teachers how they think they should be teaching. There's lesser educated parents, a lot of times they're reluctant to do that. Uh, and sometimes they get exploited because they don't ask those types of questions uh, because they just don't know the, the types of questions to ask. Um, and, and then there, a lot of times they receive a lot of uh, biased mis misconceptions, you know, because you can have a professional parent who's missing all the meetings because they're they're traveling and doing things that society sees as important. But a lot of times we don't give the same types of accommodations to those who are working uh, as a, a concierge or as a truck driver or, you know, things like that. Uh, so so these are all, um, you know, when we think about representation, we have to think about every type of representation. But we have to think more carefully about the ways in which we can't replicate them. That naturally, as a Black person, I can share that Black experience, but someone who is working class, raising several children on their own, I have to get out of my comfort zone. I have to get into your world, and I really have to learn your perspective in, in order to connect the way that I need to connect. Can I just ask one follow-up question? Um, you know, you've done so much work uh, with HBCUs, with historically Black colleges and universities. And of course, we've had a set of studies that have found that uh, on average, Black teachers, Black students who've had the opportunity to have Black teachers uh, have stronger outcomes in many ways, achievement and graduation and so on, college going. Uh, but also that uh, students who are taught by a teacher who's been trained in an HBCU, a teacher mm -hmm. of any race, um, have these same positive outcomes. And I would love your thoughts about what goes on in the teacher training in HBCUs that may be enabling that kind of productive teaching. Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I believe that HBCU culture, uh, one that uh, doesn't look at weaving out, but looks at building up, um, uh, is it, it's not the hyper competitive environment that you may see in some of these other big institutions, uh, more of a nurture, nurturing environment. And so a lot of the students are uh, uh, simply practicing what they've experienced. Um, now, with that being said, I, I, I do want us to um, uh, understand that HBCU teacher preparation programs are constantly under attack and that all of the things that HBC, HBCU students do that are so successful, that doesn't come up in practice examinations or entrance examinations or these types of things. So there are biases uh, in some of the ways in which we um, uh, rate whether or not a teacher education program is effective. There's biases that work against HBCUs. Uh, so we do need to think about those types of issues also. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, and you mentioned that, you know, so much of the framing uh, of the work in HBCUs is around the collective, around how we advance together. And I think that framing is what we've talked about in schools generally, uh, that you're building a sense of collaboration, cooperation, you know, we're in this together, which counters the social media shaming that people do, that counters the various ways in which kids also create a sort of status differential, um, you know, between and among them that then affects students in negative ways and creates that um, sense of powerlessness that then often translates into trauma and, and rage is, is, you know, part of that um, hyper competitive, uh, you know, framing that quite often goes on in school generally. So there's a lot of um, common themes uh, in both how we prepare educators and then how we support educators and students to do the work together uh, in schools. Well, we are coming up close to the end of our time and uh, I want to um, thank everyone. I want to also uh, let folks know that Superintendent Thurman had a really bad internet connection. He sent us a note uh, earlier that he you know, was not able to get back on. So we appreciated uh, his participation for the beginning of this and all of you throughout the uh, webinar. We want to let people know that uh, the webinar itself, the PowerPoint, the various studies uh, will all be on a um, event web page that you can find at the Learning Policy Institute so that you can uh, catch up with all that uh, went on here and go further and deeper on the issues that uh, are of concern to you. Uh, we also have a follow-up webinar on October the 17th at four o'clock Eastern time, one o'clock Pacific time and various in between the coasts. Um, this is gonna really deal very explicitly with approaches to restorative practices, uh, both uh, how they can be engaged in in a meaningful, fully implemented way, uh, as well as um, what the outcomes of those kinds of practices can be. Uh, so with that, we're going to thank you very much for attending. Uh, and um, bring this webinar to a close.